Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. In this episode, it is back to 1984 to discuss one of the best years in cinemas, plus our movie Battle Royale for the greatest film of that year, 1984. So let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today are my fellow hosts, John Davenport. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Wonderful. Troy Heinrichs. Wax on, wax off. And we're joined by Stan Daniel, who um, he has a doctorate in film. I believe it's 1984 specifically. Is that correct, Stan? Yeah, you got it right. Uh, that and 94, but uh, you know we'll, we'll put the 84 to use today. Sweet. We'll have to come back. Let's we'll come back to it. Uh, Amanda will not be here because she wasn't born then. So what the hell does she have to offer us? You know what I mean? Right. I mean, she's just wow. going to be sit there and say a whole lot of things like, well, I wasn't around then, but exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I kind of want to start this. And uh, if you want more information, you can always go to the Hollywood You can join our Facebook group, the Hollywood outsider run exit by popcorn. And you can email us feedback at the Hollywood But I want to talk a little bit about like, we're all, of the age we would have been alive in 1984 stan what 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 were you doing in 84 what was your life like were you watching movies much at that time or was it like a a vhs kind of deal were you still too little to care where were you at no no i was uh i was always a movie kid and uh yeah i was a big star wars nerd at 84 I, i honestly i believe that is the year that we got our first VCR, but it wouldn't have been until the end of that year. So 85 is when the, the VHS boom in our household started. Um, but I think I was probably seven or eight years old. Um, I do remember going to the theater to see one of the movies I'm talking about tonight. Um, so that was a, a cool experience. It's one of those very memorable things. So yeah, I was, I was a movie kid even back then. 84 that's uh i would have been eight years old running around uh in a different country uh we had a betamax and we had that we had the two different betamaxes at the house where only some tapes can be played on one beta and then other tapes can be played on the other one but you can't crisscross them because uh it would speed up or slow down the tape too much and you wouldn't be able to understand what's happening but it was a good time for movies i did get to see some of these in the theater um uh, you know we had theaters uh it took us a little bit to get there but we had them betamax i had a friend who had a betamax or his dad had a betamax but the only movies he had were porn <laughs> well <laughs> funny that you mentioned that because no john don't make, to- <laughs> don't make it weird don't make it Uh, My parents fancied themselves as trying to start a rental business. And so we had a collection of movies all over all sorts. And they were they they wanted to go to the States, record movies that they saw they had on HBO and whatatnot here in the States. And then they go back home and then we we had a massive movie collection because of it. Were they renting the ones they had recorded on HBO to other people? So it sounds like. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> or were they making movies and selling those? I'm confused what how this ties. I know what my story was, but uh, well, let's just you know, stop. They there. were making movies that were released on HBO that they then re-recorded. <laughs> right. So, I think that may have been Cinemax because <laughs> they didn't have the rights to their original record. I don't know. Right. Oh uh, boy, Troy. What about you? Where were you in '84? Uh, about the same as our John. About eight years old. Uh, living the dream. Um, you know, just uh, hanging out, waiting for space to be a, a big thing again. Um, and then really just enjoying the concept of movies. Cause it's like the first time I'd really been able to like be engrossed in the movie theater experience. Um, I think up to that point we really didn't have much to go to the movies. So you're trying to like catch them with like, you know, Disney at home and things of that nature. So being able to go to the movies to see things like karate kid and the gremlins and the ghostbusters, like those are iconic 84 films that, you were able to see in the theater, I thought it was really cool. Grandma and Grandpa used to take us on Sundays. Yeah, this was my heyday. This is when my mom, because we didn't have much money at this in, at this time, <clears throat> and so we would, uh, she would take me to a, the theater once a week. That was like our big, that was our big time out, which is her and I. You know, she was divorced, and so we would go to the theater. I saw pretty much everything that we're going to talk about tonight in the theater, 
And, you know, so that's probably where some of my, my favorite memories as a kid were from this era. And VHS was great because, you know, you, you, whatever you own, because they were too expensive to buy very many of them back then. You know, every once in a while you get like a big blockbuster that was 20 bucks or something, but everything else was a hundred. So you had to rent it. And if you wanted to see it more than one time, you had to rent it again. I remember trying to see Romance in the Stone, like every time I wanted to see it again, I had to go re-rent it because it wasn't a cheap movie for a while. It sucked. But, you know, those are the days. Kids don't know how well they got it these days, man. I'm just going <laughs> to oh, stream man. it. I'm not going to wait. I, I don't want to wait. I want to stream it right now. Is it on the Plex server? Because if it's on the Plex server, I'll watch it. But if I have to go find it anywhere else, I won't. Exactly. What kind of what kind of nonsense is that? Oh, those well, are the days. Things, they took forever to be released onto VHS because I was when I was thinking about this today, you know, and, and Return of the Jedi was released in eighty three, eighty three, yep. but it didn't come out on VHS until eighty five, and so I remember we had our VCR and like the posters were up for weeks beforehand. Yep. And it was such a big deal, but it was you know a year before you could watch it outside of the theater. Oh, and you remember the the posters back then? Like they were real art. They were, yes. they were just headshots of Tom Cruise over and over again in the same right. different sunglasses or something. I mean, it was like real art. Artistry was put into those. Mm-hmm. Drew Struzan made his bones completely off of the 80s and 90s. Oh. It's, ugh, I, Beautiful I, I miss those days. Beautiful time. And Stan and I both, each of the movie, one of the movies that we're talking about, each of us are talking about, actually affected ratings for the rest of time, or at least up until now. Just there you go. There's a little tint. Uh, tint? There's a tease. Tint? I don't know what I'm saying. Stop. What but, happened? I don't know. <laughs> My brain exploded. It's a taste or a hint. Yeah. It's a taste. <laughs> it's a tint. <laughs> it's a tint. That's the sort of thing I do, Aaron. How dare you? You're taking my bit away. I'm sorry. All right. So let's talk about 1984. Like what film, cinema, TV. I don't care. I mean, what really, when you look back at that era and you're, I mean, here are the top 10 films for 1984, just to give you an idea of the quality. Romance in the Stones, number 10. Oh, we're, we're going to go up to one. Terms of Endearment, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, Beverly Hills Cop, Footloose, Police Academy. <laughs> that's where I learned how to go. <laughs> um, the Karate Kid, that's where I learned how to sweep the leg. Gremlins, that's where I learned time zones don't apparently matter. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and Ghostbusters. Like, that's a collection. But then you go you go down that list further, Splash, Purple Rain, The Natural, Revenge of the Nerds, Bachelor Party, Red Dawn, The Terminator, Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, which is easily the best one. There's a Dirty Harry movie, The Last Starfighter, blah, 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 blah. There's like so many great films in that year. Man, we were it was an embarrassment of riches. Is an embarrassment that Star Trek 3 was actually in the top 10. <laughs> <laughs> Did well. What I noticed was uh, when I was looking at the box office, um, it was sort of the end of a trend, maybe the beginning of a new one, because only two of the top 10 movies that year were sequels. If you look at the rest of them, every other film in the top 10 box office got a sequel or at least one sequel, even Terms of Endearment had a sequel. True. And m- most of them were part of, you know, multi-film franchises. So it's just, it was a, it really was sort of an end of a, an era because up until this year, you know, you look at the top 10 in box office and everything's a sequel or part of a franchise or IP. Well, and the tie into that this year or within the, within a 12 month period of this year, uh, the Karate Kid's getting another sequel. <laughs> Uh, Indiana <laughs> Jones just had its sequel. Ghostbusters has another sequel coming out. Beverly Hills Cop has another sequel coming out. So like, <laughs> this is like the best year ever. I mean, it's at least in the top five that I can think of. 1984, not this year. Yeah, 1984. This year just started. So maybe it will be. Yeah, we're we're talking as if we're in 1984. Maybe 2024 will have the same sort of effect where we start getting into something a lot more... Uh, where more flavors or more tastes of what's out there is start to be experimented with, uh, you know, to play with more with that tint uh, game, the Varens. But I, it's it's so wonderful to sit there and look at everything that was 
in the theater back then and go, God, I could have gone and saw anything from any era and been able to play with it. Whereas nowadays you are, you don't have the same sort of choices. It's going to be this, this sequel or that superhero movie or this story that links into this story. And it, it just, it is exhausting. And let me ask you this question. Do, do you feel like, cause I mean, you know, back in the, in the eighties, you would have a movie that, you know, like Ghostbusters, Temple of Doom, Gremlins, those kinds of movies where they would come out, have $10 million weekend, something like that. And they would just play for uh, six months, you know, Return of the Jedi, which you mentioned already that played for, you know, God damn near a year or whatever. I mean, that would not happen today. I mean, it's so rare that that happens today, but back then that was the norm because we didn't have many options, obviously, but still it was the norm. And it was, it was wonderful to actually go to a movie and have lines. Remember when we had lines, you would have to wait in line to see something and you would be with, you'd be so tight with your neighbor. <laughs> you'd be so snug and cozy with the other people coming to see the movie. It was almost, you know, illegal. Well, and they were in the theaters for a long period of time and there were only four, six screens, maybe eight if you were lucky, not 32. Yeah. Like some of the places have today. True. Yeah, we had the four screen multiplex that probably it, it could have opened in 1984 as far as I remember. But um, there was something communal and, you know, you really did feel a part of, of a movie going crowd. Uh, that being said, I, I love, uh, you know, getting my seats a week in advance. Uh, so that's, yeah. that is a good thing. But uh, I, I do miss, I do miss that line for, for the big movies, you know, um, I can count the number of films that I stood in line for, for hours for. And, you know, I don't, I don't regret a second of that because you just kind of hung out and, you know, chatted with your friends or the people that you went with or the total stranger that you're standing next to. And it was, it was a great time. It was communal. It was, it was really just an experience. It was meant to be for everyone. You know, now it's, it's not like that anymore. Now it's more people that love the theater still go to the theater. A lot of people are very just comfortable sitting on their couch. It's just not the same scenario as it was. Sound like old people saying, man, it was really great back in my day. <laughs> back in my day. Back in my, geez, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I can remember the, uh, the com communal experience of movies lasting through most of the yachts and maybe the first couple of years of the 2010s. And then slowly but surely that whole communal experience started going away. And I don't know what was the, the, the event that, that was the preceding event that caused that. The what, phone. what made it start? The phone. Video games. All right. Video, uh, video, video games have been around. No, forever, not video man. games. I think it's, yeah. I think it's the phone, the, the prevalence of the phone. Everyone has the ability in their pocket to watch whatever they want, whenever they want. Now they didn't have that before. Now they can, well, I can literally sit on and watch most movies on my phone or, you know, in traffic or at the airport or at the, you know, in the car while you're not driving, you know, you can listen to that. I mean, that's the only time I do watch stuff in the car is when I'm driving. <laughs> no, it is. I'm not even kidding. I actually have Stop. two arms. I don't want to be arrested or ticketed or something <laughs> for, for you. Those communal experiences, they still do happen. They're just a lot more infrequent. I mean, a lot of the, the Barbenheimer was a communal experience sure. and it happened for end game. Um, I guess no way home. Uh, it happened for Spider-Man. No way home. True. Uh, but it's just, it's, it's not as organic as it, uh, it's may have been years ago. Thanks COVID. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Well, you know, let's go back to the phone argument because since since they've made it progressively easier and easier to buy your movie tickets, there's no more standing in line to buy your movie tickets. Or if you do, it's not as it's not the way it used to be. Um, but you can just buy your tickets, go straight in the theater in some some cases, and go find your seat that you've already reserved. Like that's that's a lot of things that have have changed that take away that communal experience because you no longer ha are forced to be in this corral where you have to wait take a couple steps, wait, take a couple steps. You can now do it, do all the pur purchasing, all the deciding through your phone, and then you're done. So you're saying you can choose to sit as far away from everyone else as humanly possible? Absolutely. Sure. See, what I do is I, I like to go to a screening where there's only four seats taken, and I sit right next to them. Like, I just, I just cozy <laughs> right up to them. I'm just right up on them. I'm like, hey, what's up? How you doing? Let's enjoy this movie together. Put my arm around them, share my popcorn, yeah. everything. I usually sit behind those people. Turn my phone on, 
Turn the ringer up. <laughs> get those seats Start, to myself. Get the most crinkly candy I can possibly think yeah. of and spend the whole five minutes of first five minutes of the movie trying to open you the want crinkly some? candy. You want some? No? So you guys are telling me all the reasons why I don't like going to the theater. <laughs> it, might, it might be what I'm saying. Yeah, it could be. Oh, 1984. All right. So let's get into our movie battle royale. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the Hollywood Outsider Movie Battle Royale. That is where we take eight films, two favorites from each of our hosts, and we determine which one is the ultimate greatest film in the entire whole universe. It is definitely a lot of fun, and it is time to get to it. Let's decide what is the greatest film of a genre. It's time for the Movie Battle Royale. All right, before we get into our top eight movies we, we took a listener poll and we did have to take at least four of these top five and incorporated into our choices for the first battle royale ever i believe the entire top five was actually used now should we have any ties they will be decided by this poll now for those that have never listened before we break 1984 down to each of our top two films one of those obviously from that top five then present them to you and our fellow hosts for judgment and voting the winner of each person's then competes against the other hosts until we get to the final one the winner for the best film of 1984 and then it's decided so you can't have the argument anymore whatever it is that is the best movie of 1984 done whenever your friends bring it up you just tell them i listened to the hollywood outsider they had a battle royale this was the winner are we clear on these rules no, wait, hold on a second. The last time we did this and I won, you guys told me I didn't win. The movie wins, John. <laughs> you don't win. But it was win. my argument to make but I you, made the argument. You don't win. The movie wins. Nobody ever said you the movie didn't win. You're the one that's making this about you. Nobody's talking about you. We're talking about the movie. I said the I'm, movie is the best of 1984. That's what I said. But right, but I decided I chose the movie. What does this have to do and with you? I argued anything I'm talking about. What does it have to do with you? That's what I'm asking you. Everything. Nothing. Not not even not a single syllable <laughs> of what I said had to do with you. Are you good? But you no. Well, go to your room. But come out <laughs> okay. when it's your turn. All right. All right. <laughs> we break these into Ho North and Ho South. Stan, your guest, you're 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 part of Ho South because Troy and I are Ho North. Sucker. So. Troy, why don't you go ahead and start us off? What are your two films? Sell them to us. Why are both of your films the best of 1984? All right. My two movies are obviously the ones that are going to win this week because my two movies are actually still airing to this day in 2024. That one movie that Aaron will talk about, his franchise ended last year, so not as cool. But my first movie we're going to discuss is Ghostbusters. I'm worried, Ray. It's getting crowded in there, and all my recent data points to something big on the horizon. What do you mean, the big? Well, let's say this Twinkie represents the normal amount of psychokinetic energy in the New York area. According to this morning sample, it would be a Twinkie 35 feet long, weighing approximately 600 pounds. <coughs> That's a big Twinkie. Yes, that's right. Ghostbusters is a timeless classic that has captured the hearts and imaginations of moviegoers for decades. Released in 1984, this supernatural comedy film has become the iconic pop culture, spawning franchises, sequels, even a reboot. It's directed by Ivan Reitman and written by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis. Ghostbusters followed the adventures of a group of eccentric scientists turned ghost exterminators in New York City. That's right. I said it. New York City. Um, it has a dedicated fan base. It has won two Academy Awards for Best Visual Effects and Best Original Song by Ray Parker Jr. Um, it still receives positive reviews from critics even to this day. Bill Murray ad-libbed like 99% of the movie, which I think is just a, a feat that you can't even like put words to unless you're Bill Murray. Um, it has memorable quotes like, who are you going to call? And I ain't afraid to know ghosts. It spawned an animated television series. It is every freaking where. Ghostbusters also grossed $295 million in 1984, which in today's money, today, that would be $870 million. That's right, almost reaching the billion dollar mark if Ghostbusters dropped in 2023. And get this, it's dropping a new movie in 2024. 
So Ghostbusters, clearly, hands down, one of the best movies of 1984. All right, my second movie is The Karate Kid. I hear you jumped some of my students last night. Afraid the facts mixed up. You calling Mr. Lawrence a liar? No call no one, nothing. What are you here for, old man? Come ask, leave boy alone. What's the matter? The boy can't take care of his own problems? One to one problem, yes. Five to one problem. Too much ask anyone. Is that what's bothering you? The odds. Well, we can fix that. You like matching, Mr. Lawrence? Yes, Sensei! Uh, no more fighting. This is a karate dojo, not a knitting class. You don't come in my dojo and drop a challenge and leave, old man. Now, you get your boy on the matter, you and I will have a major problem. Too much advantage. Your dojo. Name a place. Tournament. Now, Karate Kid starts off with probably one of the best friggin' songs ever in a movie that wasn't even written for its movie. It was actually written for Karate, uh, not Karate, it was written for Rocky 3 and then used in Karate Kid because it did not end up working in Rocky 3, which is, of course, You're the Best Around, which is an awesome song. Uh, Karate Kid is a timeless classic. It has captivated audiences since its release in 1984. Directed by John G. Avildsen, this iconic film tells the story of a teenage boy named Daniel LaRusso. He moves to a new town and finds himself at odds with a group of bullies. And with the help of a wise old martial arts instructor named Mr. Miyagi, Daniel son learns the art of karate and transforms both his physical and his mental strength. And also every kid that watched this could do the crane kick by the end of the movie. They tried, they failed and fell on their asses when they went to school that next day, but they tried and that's all that mattered. Um, Pat Moriarty's role as Mr. Miyagi in this film earned him an Academy award nomination the iconic wax on wax off scene has become a cultural phenomenon. Uh, Karate Kid has now also spawned not only one, but two, but three, but four movies that have come after the original and a television show that has now run for is it four seasons. Has it been season four now? Five? Season five? I forget. I've lost count because it's so many seasons of Cobra Kai and they're finally going to make a movie that is going to tie Karate Kid and the next Karate Kid, Jackie Chan version, Mr. Han, they're actually going to bring Mr. Han into the universe with the next Karate Kid movie, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So I think everything you know about Karate Kid taught you, if you were an eight-year-old in 1984, how to be a better person, how to have better control of your temper, how to uh, no be there, and all kinds of other stuff. Karate Kid is something that actually transcended pop culture and is still living in the zeitgeist today so much so that Aaron Peterson himself on this show wore a karate gi in front of thousands of people just to interview Ralph Macchio and Billy Zabka so with that karate kid is also the best movie of 1984 first up to vote let's go ahead with our guest Mr. Stan what say you two absolute bangers Troy um a tough decision because Ghostbusters it's it's so funny, and it, 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 it's got a few scary moments. It's so iconic, but I'm probably going to have to go with Karate Kid. <gasps> wow. um, I don't know if I've it, – it, it was up there with, like, the most watched film of my childhood, That uh, the, the crane kick, the, the music is so good, and uh, so it, it just holds a special place in my heart. Just, just inching out, Ghostbusters. You wanted to date Elizabeth Shue, too. I understand. Oh, oh, yeah. Who didn't? And Mr. Miyagi. And, and Mr. Miyagi. Hang on. Let's roll back. <laughs> <laughs> that deserves an explanation. Yeah. Really need, really need to know about how the Pat Morita love came into well, this. Let me guess. It started like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see that guy, the way he works his hands? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's funny. All right. One vote for a crowded kid. Uh, or John. All right, so Karate Kid, I don't have the kind of love for Karate Kid that most people have, which which you can tell by the fact that I still haven't watched the stupid show that everyone was telling me I have to go watch, mm. so Ghostbusters it is. Wow. All right, Aaron, mm -hmm. tiebreaker. I mean, I should remind, uh, uh, well, Troy just reminded, but I'll remind people again, I did uh, dress in Karate Gi to do the panel with Cobra Kai. Like, to, I'm a fan, is what I'm saying. Big fan. So it's proton packs 
or sweep the leg? Well, I mean, if you really, really think about it, Ghostbusters was the best around in terms of these two movies. It just, it just was. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray and Harold Ramis and Ernie Hudson, who never gets enough credit. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going that way. Ghostbusters it is. But it's closer than it should have been. I'll tell you that. Every movie 1984 is that. <sighs> That's true. So true. That's so true. Toxic Avenger is 1984. We're good without mentioning it, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Ghostbusters moves on. I don't think it's a real big surprise. But Karate Kid, I was I, standing at me almost convinced to, to change my vote. I'm just letting you know. I was teetering. That's because you and Stan almost have this like bromance thing going uh-huh. on. It's because he can grow a beard. Nice. It's the backpacking. Yeah. It is. They share Mr. Miyagi on the weekend. Let's go backpacking. Mm-hmm. I can do that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so slow, slow down. It's my turn. <laughs> my first movie is Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. The villagers rock and the old legend of the Shankara stones. Dr. Dirt, you're all vulnerable to vicious rumors. I seem to remember that in Honduras you were accused of being a grave robber rather than an archaeologist. Well, the newspapers greatly exaggerated the incident. And wasn't it the Sultan of Madagascar who threatened to cut your head off if you ever returned to his country? No, it wasn't my head. Then your hands, perhaps. No, it wasn't my hands. It was my... my misunderstanding. Exactly what we have here, Dr. Jones. This came out May 23rd, 1984. It changed my entire life. My entire family went to this movie. We all saw it together. One of the best experiences of my entire life. Indiana Jones on an adventure that just goes from place to place. Shanghai to India and bam, 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 bam. It's just nonstop adventure. He's trying to save a bunch of children, but he can't do it all by himself because he has short round as his dutiful sidekick and Willie as his annoying side piece, I guess is the best way to say that. Everyone contributes. It's not just Indiana Jones. He's really, really at risk. There's a lot of wild things that happen in this film. It's one of the reasons that we have the PG-13 rating. The other one will be talked about when Stan talks. But those are the two movies that were so graphic (laughs) that they inspired the need for a PG-13 rating because they believe that PG isn't strong enough because this movie's so damn hard. And that came out wrong. So you've got Indiana Jones, you've got Short Round, still mad they didn't put him in Dial of Destiny, you've got Nonstop Adventure. It's not as beloved as Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I think in terms of film production, that's a perfect movie. Last Crusade is beloved by many. This is my favorite Indiana Jones movie of all of them. To me, this is everything I love about Indiana Jones, the character, the the set pieces, the, the just the way that the adventure just escalates and elevates and it gets more insane as the movie goes. It just reminds me of everything I love about adventure films and the end on the bridge where Indy is just trapped on both sides. And he just says, Oh shit. (laughs) And takes the whole bridge down because that's his best course of action. That that's, that's my hero. That's my hero. The guy that will do anything to win. And I just absolutely love this movie so much. Trust me. That's number one. My second one is, oh, by the way, it did make $333 million worldwide on a $28 million budget, so it was way bigger than Ghostbusters. Suck it. All right, Terminator. The 600 series had rubber skin. We spotted them easy. But these are new. They look human. Sweat, bad breath, everything. Very hard to spot. I had to wait till he moved on you before I could zero him. Look, I am not stupid, you know. They cannot make things like that yet. Not yet. Not for about 40 years. This is the movie that introduced the world to Arnold Schwarzenegger and created a name no one could even really say for like the first 10 years. But hey, it did what it did. It took time time travel and made it feel like it was possible it took a, a very minuscule budget of 6.5 million and just created an entire world that we still kind of go back to today. And that's a full year before back to the future. It's sci-fi spectacle. It had a wonderful twist ending. 
he is John Connor's father. What? Like all, it's just mind blowing how that all worked. Somehow the time travel still works in your brain. You get the famous quote, I'll be back. And it showed you what you can do with very little money, but also introduced the world to James Cameron, who then later delivered an even better film with Terminator 2, Judgment Day. And this one made $78 million worldwide, which is pretty big for such a small film. And that's Terminator. So now I go to you guys. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom versus Terminator, the first one. What say you? Troy, I'll go to you first. Raiders of the Lost Ark was fantastic. Start to finish and the middle and everything in between. Just super, super exciting. Temple of Doom was boring as shit compared to Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's a great film. What? It has lots of great Indiana Jones moments. It has lots of great Indiana Jones actors. But in comparison, the moving is boring as shit. You just said it was great and then also boring as shit in the same sentence. No, I said Raiders of the Lost Ark was great. I said Temple of Doom was good. No, you said it was great. Roll the tape. What it's boring. is happening right now? It's boring as shit <laughs> it's boring. compared to the Terminator. The Terminator it, was my first R-rated experience drunk. as a kid, and Terminator was fantastic. Get Amanda Terminator on here. Was, Can we get Amanda on here? Where's Amanda at? Terminator was blowing shit up. Terminator was shooting stuff. Terminator had a sex scene. Terminator was awesome and had the super cool twist that he was his dad. Like term, Everything about the Terminator was just cool and awesome and fun and exciting, and that's why Terminator is going to get my vote. I don't know what just happened. Stan? <laughs> Well, uh, I, I agree with um, with Troy. There is a sex scene in Terminator, <laughs> but um, <laughs> and it's great. I, I but I came to it later, and when I think of the Terminator, I think of T two. I, I don't think of the original uh, as good as it is, and as as well as those effects hold up, um, and as big of a star as it made Arnold Schwarzenegger. But I mean, come on, Temple of Doom. It was my favorite of the original trilogy growing up. I, I, my opinions changed over time. It's still awesome. I still watch it every couple of years. And the bridge scene is, if if it's not my favorite scene of all time, it's it's in the running for it. So, uh, hands down, Temple of Doom. Maybe we are having a bromance because I'm with you all the way. All the way. Love that scene so much. He no nuts. I, I, he crazy. I... <laughs> I still don't know the words that came out of Troy's mouth. Um, <laughs> I, somehow they cut me uh, and they, they just reached my core and broke part of me that I just didn't think was going to be able to be broken. Uh, I can't imagine choosing Terminator 2 over Temple of Doom. It is my favorite. I can't either because it was Terminator 1. Yeah, it was Terminator 1, not Terminator 2, but go ahead. <laughs> Whatever. I sorry, you're right. I can't imagine choosing Terminator over Temple of Doom. I really just can't. For all the reasons the other two have mentioned, it also is just uh, a nonstop ride. It also is uh, has one of my favorite movies mo movie moments ever, which is that movie moment where they're in the room and the ceiling is coming down, and you see Indy's face, and he says the words, "We are going <laughs> to, to die." die. And I love that scene so much. And every time I say something like we are going to die, that's the scene I'm picturing in my head. I don't picture anything out of, I mean, maybe, uh, um, oh, what was her name? Uh, um, Willie? No, no, I'm thinking about Terminator. Linda, Linda Hamilton, um, Hamilton, L Linda Hand Hamilton. Maybe I'm picturing a little bit of Linda Hamilton, but I'm still, I, I still would go back and just picture like that scene whenever I feel like saying something that sounds like we are going to die. That's where I am. That's why it's Temple of Doom. I love that movie, especially more than Terminator. Okay. Any argument you could have made, Troy, it wasn't the best of the Indian. Okay. Boring as shit. You are drunk. high. I don't even know what's going on in your head. In comparison to Raiders. No. It's no. no, Raiders is more boring. It is. No. This is like <laughs> no. nonstop. I remember getting the VHS tape under the tree and I cut a little hole in the paper because it was wrapped. It was my Christmas present. And I pulled it out and I watched it like 40 times before I ever got it for Christmas. You know why? Because it's not boring as shit. That's right. why. <laughs> for me, Indiana Jones has the reverse Star Trek problem. The odd ones are good. The even ones are awful. You're insane. Yes. In the membrane. 
Like his mom was looking at him side eye because when he w- they were watching it together after on Christmas, she's like, "Why is the tracking all off the entire time?" Because he watched it that many times. <laughs> Kids, there was a thing called tracking. Oh man, you remember tracking? <laughs> oh, right, God, tracking oh. sucked. <laughs> Uh, oh right. Okay, so there was this knob on the on the VHS. <laughs> we don't need to explain it. Doesn't exist anymore. I actually no do, would like to know which uh, which parts in particular that you find boring, Troy. The whole movie. Uh, honestly, I, honestly, the, the the part that I find boring is everything leading up to them actually getting into the temple. The 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 food scene, the walking around, the. It just drags, and and yeah, oh, that, oh, the, that fifteen the great minutes, character moments, the fifteen minutes yeah. of character moments really bored you. It bored me. So you don't you don't like the opening musical number? <laughs> I actually I like the opening <laughs> sequence with the restaurant and the shootout and the plane ride and all of that is great. And that just kind of like after the plane thing, it's it just kind of like stalls. But then it gets to the temple and it's great. They're literally that's a fifteen minute difference in time. <laughs> so it's boring as shit from a fifteen minute window. <laughs> And the whole things in the temple are boring. Like the, sure. the, he the can't blood tell and time. the drinking and the cage and the. Have you seen Temple of Doom? I'm not convinced you yes. have anymore. <laughs> the the minecart sequence is good, and the Doctor Jones is good, and that's a. That's all almost stuff. the entire movie. <laughs> no. That minecart sequence it goes on for, for a while. It's like it's almost while. as long as a pod time, race yeah. would be, which is also boring. Uh, it's way better than the pod race. It's what the pod race. It, it is way better than the pod race. Wow. It it really did. That's what it wanted to be. Yeah. Wow. I just in comparison at the time in 1984, it just it wasn't Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was like, what is this movie? I don't understand. Okay, well, and then Terminator comes out, and you're like, wow, that's wow, that's cool. Oh, man, he's a robot. What? Man, I like the Terminator a lot, and I can make the case for it, but I ain't close. Also, Dan, you might not know this, but robots. I mean, robots win every time for me. Well, it's because he <laughs> is a robot. Mm-hmm. That's fair. All right, now we're at uh, Ho South. So Ghostbusters and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom move on. We're at Ho South. John or Stan? I'll let I'll let you decide. Who who wants to go I'm first? I'm gonna let Stan go first. Okay. Stan, you go ahead. Well, that's good because I do have the two best movies mm. uh from nineteen eighty four. And I'll go okay, ahead never and say mind. Advance. I don't want Stan to go. No. <laughs> <laughs> now they they didn't have the the long lasting box office nor the the uh, intellectual property appeal, but that is some of it's due to uh, legal battles and the rights issues, mm. uh, and I think they're they're films that have grown in their estimation over time. And the first one is Gremlins. Would you say this was called a putrid stage? Pupil, pupil stage. Like a butterfly. Yeah, right. Right, this is a cocoon. And inside, he's going through changes. Lots of changes. Like my mother. Uh, No. No, that's different. This is called a metamorphosis. It's a change in form and in appearance. So Gremlins is about a young man who inadvertently breaks three important rules concerning his new pet and unleashes a horde of malevolently mischievous monsters on a small town. So Gremlins, it is so many genres in one. You've got horror. You've got comedy. It's a monster movie. It's a Christmas movie. It's a live action Looney Tunes. And it's a family film. It's a sweet film. And it also has some commentary on you know, Reagan era economics and uh, consumerism. Uh, it was produced by Steven Spielberg. It was written by Christopher Columbus that uh, also directed Home Alone. And it was directed by Joe Dante. It's it's filled with a bunch of other movie references. It's got a lot of meta uh, to this movie. Um, I think it's expertly directed. There's some just beautifully brilliant shots. Um, it starts off with like this weird, almost noir opening with Hoyt Axton set in some undisclosed Chinatown. Sure, it's uh, it's kind of racist, and it's a depiction of uh, stereotypical Chinese Americans. But uh, ultimately, this one character is the is the smartest person in the in the uh, film's world. So there is that at least. Um, it then proceeds to set up the three rules. And you know what? I'm not going to talk about them because what fun is that? <laughs> they make no sense, and who cares? It's true. Um, it fades out of this noir opening, and then it bursts with this beautiful uh, Snow White, 
idyllic uh, small town with Darling Love's Christmas, Baby Please Come Home playing in the background. And it just, you, you've had this major shift in tone from this sort of dark, seedy uh, underbelly where uh, this guy's dad essentially steals a creature <laughs> from an old man. And then you get this beautiful, like, Norman Rockwell scene. And it's just, so you're like, what am I in for? I don't know, but I want some more. Uh, Gremlins has awesome characters. First and foremost, you've got Gizmo, who inarguably is the cutest character of all time. Hello, Gizmo. Um, Gizmo. <laughs> he's voiced by Howie Mandel, mm. and uh, you know, for better or worse, he's great in this role. Uh, your leads are Billy, uh, who's he's just kind of this likable everyman. He's probably the weakest part of the movie, but uh, he's easy to root for. Then you have Phoebe Cates. Now, it's not her most famous scene which was in Fast Times Original High, but it is her best scene when she breaks down and tells the story of her dad (laughs) breaking his neck while climbing down the chimney dressed as Santa Claus. It gets so dark, this movie. Um, Hoyt Axton plays Billy's dad, who's a, a terrible inventor. And he sort of knows he's terrible, but he, you know, he just has this great attitude and he never stops and he loves his family. And Billy's mom is the best character in the movie. And I actually, you know, if they ever bring up a, a gremlin spinoff, I want her character to be the, the lead. She is, she's awesome. Um, you got great bad guys. You got Polly Holiday playing Mrs. Deagle, who's like Ebenezer Scrooge and Mr. Potter from, uh, it's a wonderful life rolled into one and you know, she's bad from the beginning. She wants to kill Billy's dog. So that's always a, a sign of a great bad guy. Absolutely. And then you got judge Reinhold playing the quintessential yuppie. <laughs> who's just obsessed with money and uh, climbing the corporate ladder. And uh, the movie's only real failures. He doesn't quite get his, his comeuppance. Um, you also got a great, just a uh, little mean monster and stripe. Uh, he's, He's mean, he's crass, he's cunning, he he's a he leads all the rest of the gremlins into mischief and mayhem. And and these these little monsters, they just sort of seem to to want to watch the world burn, and they take such joy in it. Um the creature work, the practical effects are all just awesome. Um and you know, it's got Corey Feldman. So I mean, obviously oh, that's you can't have point. the best movie sure. of a year without Corey Feldman. Um Talk about great scenes when Billy's mom first discovers that the gremlins are in her house. She proceeds to realize that monsters are invading her home. Then she sticks a creature into a blender or a mixer. She stabs one to death with a butcher knife and then sprays a monster in the face with bug spray into a microwave until it explodes. And I think that was the the scene along with the heart ripping scene from Raiders mm-hmm. or from uh, Temple of Doom that led to the PG thirteen ratings. Yep. So, so ultimately, you've got a movie that has something for everybody. It walks a tightrope with multiple genres. It was released in the summer. I watch it almost every Christmas, but you can watch it at Halloween. So you've got fun for the whole family and you can watch it year round. So what more can you want from a movie? Good luck selling your second one. <laughs> oh, it's even better. Oh, oh, I know what it is. No, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Spoiler alert. All right, Aaron. Uh, who are you? Uh, I guess I have to sell it. Yeah, rather than, uh, sell, sell me on vote. this one. <laughs> sell me on this one. All right. So that being said. The never-ending story. He doesn't understand that he's the one who has the power to stop it. He simply can't imagine that one little boy could be that important. Is it really me? Maybe he doesn't know what he has to do! What do I have to do? He has to give me a new name. He's already chosen it. He just has to call it out. But it's only a story. It's not real. It's only a story. So the Neverending Story is about a troubled boy who dives into a wondrous fantasy world through the pages of a mysterious book. Um, so this wasn't nearly as successful. It wasn't. I mean, it made money, uh, but it wasn't nearly as financially successful. But I think it is grown in estimation 
uh, even more than Gremlins. It, it uh, I think it stands the test of time, and I think it gets new fans on a regular basis. It was directed by Wolfgang Peterson. Uh, he's a, a German director that directed Das Boots and Enemy Mine and The Line of Fire, Air Force One, and for better or worse, Troy. Um, at the time, it was the most expensive production in German film history, and I think all of that money shows in its, in its production value. The sets and the creature design are super inventive. You've got all these wild monsters and creatures uh, that look fantastic. You've got wonderful sets and map paintings. Um, once again, we probably mentioned it multiple times on this podcast, but practical effects, that's, that's kind of where it's at. You've got uh, your main character is a, a child named Bastion, and I think he was supposed to be somewhere between 8 and 10 years old. Uh, and this kid was really good. He, he was only in a couple of movies, um, but he was really good in this movie. Um, once he starts reading his never ending story, it sort of turns into a princess bride like um, storytelling device where you get his story in the so called real world, but then you get the fantasy that he's reading about. And his avatar, so to speak, is a Treyu. And he's a, you know, he's a fun hero. Um, he's a little older than, than Bastion and, you know, he's, uh, destined to save the, the, uh, childlike empress. Uh, he's given this super cool emblem called, uh, the Auron, uh, to kind of lead his way. You've got all kinds of great characters, rock biters, uh, racing snails. You've got a, a giant turtle named Morla and Falcor, which is a, you know, a lucky giant flying dog. So who wouldn't want that? Uh, it's got a, it's just a great story. It is a fantastic fantasy film. I'd say one of the best fantasy movies of all time. But I think the thing that really makes this a great movie, it has like some really intense themes that are sort of wrapped into a, a children's movie. The main villain is the nothing. The description given in the movie is that it it's, there's nothing there. It's emptiness. And it wants people to lose hope because that makes them easy to control. And it's got this servant called the Gamork, which is this midnight black werewolf creature. And it is, I mean, it's legitimately scary. Now, there's a few theories about what the nothing actually is. Some people think it's nihilism. Some people think it's dark imagination. I think it's actually depression hmm. because people think of depression as sadness, but it's more a lack of joy. It's an absence of hope. Um, and sometimes it's even the loss of sadness. It's feeling nothing. And Bastion in, in this world is, has lost his mom. He gets bullied. Um, he gets no support from his dad. So what's happening is he's, you know, this kid's getting depressed. And through this story where he's gifted the, the gift of infinite wishes, he starts like surrounding himself with creatures and people that understand him and love him. So it's just got this fantastic, timeless, relatable message. And it has the most traumatic scene of all the eighties. When Artex, the horse dies in the swamp of eternal sadness, it is the saddest thing you'll ever see. And I think we need more of that in kids movies. We need, we need some trauma for these kids. <laughs> we need these kids to suffer a little bit, build some character. Well, it does. It, it it's it's given to us in a in a real palatable way. Um, Death is part of life. It wrecked me at the time, but it, it it sort of helps you build. So I think it's just this amazing message movie wrapped in this wonderful fantasy film. It's heartbreaking, but it's completely satisfying at the same time. So that's the never ending story. Aaron, you're gonna have to make a make a vote on these two. <laughs> you're gonna have to make me go first, huh? Uh, well, I've never been a big fan of never ending story. Um, great sale sales pitch though. I mean, you really you know, sold that movie better than anybody ever else has. I just will never get over Falcor, the creepy pedophile luck dragon. Cause you know, <laughs> I like children. Yeah, you do. You freak. Of course you do. Just weird. Can't do it. So it's gremlins all the way because gremlins is a timeless classic. I... Probably, I mean, don't get me wrong. We've had the childlike empress on the podcast. Look in the feed. You can find the interview. We interviewed her. Wonderful person. It's true. Uh, if you've never listened to it. And she really pointed out some interesting things about the film. I, I 
didn't know and I respect, and I do think it is a movie that's built around chi- uh, a child's imagination and depression is very much in, in context with what happens in the film. And I think that's great. Gremlins is something I can come back to over and over and over again. It speaks to me. It really has a, a timelessness quality. The effects, like you said, are just phenomenal. I mean, you know, it's all, all so much of the practical effects feel totally realized gizmo you know is fake the entire time but you fall in love with that stupid thing the second you see it the second you hear it and you just want one you want to, we would all go buy one knowing the rules knowing we don't know what time zone that applies to we would still go buy a, a, a freaking mogwai tomorrow so gremlins i like children i mean this really is a no-brainer vote but i mean the funny thing about never ending story is that you it's so quotable at the same time. Like I can, I could pull lines from this movie left and right from, you know, they look like big, strong hands, don't they? You know, um, come for me, Gamora. See, I am a tray. I'm starting to see a trend. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, nothing yeah, the, yeah. matters. <laughs> Maybe he's depressed because of all the pedophiles he's surrounded by. <laughs> It has to hurt if it's going to heal. Oh, Stop. my God. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You <laughs> can see straight into your heart. All right. Good night. I'm out. <laughs> I'm so out right now. <laughs> the Never Ending Story, as weird as it is, is definitely one that's a time is classic. And I think you know, reaches it. <laughs> <laughs> reaches out to people, touches people's emotions. And so, my God, it just never ends. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, I think, you know, when you look at these two movies and say, like, what was a quintessential movie of 1984? I don't think people remember Never Ending Story was in 1984. When they hear Gremlins, they go 1984, PG-13, the rating and everything, the blender, the microwave, the movie theater, the swimming pool, the, the trucks driving around in the department store. Uh, all of that is just screams off the screen as like, how did they actually pull that off? Because that is fantastic. The tractor, the Mrs. Deagle flying up the stairs in the chair thing. Uh, there's so many good things about Gremlins that Gremlins totally gets the win in these two side by side. And Mrs. Deacons is totally Corella DeVille too. Deagle, Deagle, Deagle. Well, John, your uh, your vote is means nothing but uh right yeah <laughs> it really think? does you know it's tough because it, all right so i have two different like questions going through in my head so what would 1984 me say to this answer and then uh what did i it, what what do i which viewing experience do i remember the most so i would say that 1984 me would love to say that never ending story was the better better movie because it has this fantastical feel to it everything looks different and it has so many things that 1984 me would love uh and especially the message even though 1984 me would not understand the message entirely it would still sort of resonate with 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 me to a degree but i remember going to see gremlins in the movie theater with my family over summer we were in the states and we came to the states for a summer vacation my brother and i talked my parents into taking us to go see gremlins and my sister was coming with us and she's like two or three at the time um maybe three or four whatever it doesn't matter my brother and I are cowering at one point into these little balls, hiding our faces from the screen because we did not sign up for what we got in that movie. <laughs> but I still love that entire thing. My little sister is laughing the entire way. My parents are laughing at my brother and I. And yet uh, it's just such a solid memory. And that's why I'm going to vote Gremlins. It's a sweep. Yeah, I forgot to mention Gremlins is probably the most frightened I've ever been at a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was a horror kid. Like mm-hmm. my parents took me to the drive in and I saw Halloween and the Amityville horror and like things that are super scary. And I, I got up and walked out of gremlins for a little while, uh, because that's, that's how frightened I was. There, there was some way, some, for some reason it was the one of the, it was a harder movie to suspend disbelief at that age. <laughs> so I felt with never ending story. Cause I felt triggered. <laughs> <laughs> Who touched you as a child? I don't want to talk about it. All right, John, it's your turn. 
my very first movie I'm going to bring to the table is one of the fan favorites, and it is Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> I can describe all of them. Please move to the side of the car and put your hands on the hood. Why? What's with you guys? You heard what he said, sir. Do it right now, please. Oh. What kind of shit is this, man? Hold up. Wait a second. You guys are arresting me for getting thrown out of a fucking window? I got thrown out of a window, man. Gun partner. Sir, you are under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to have an attorney present during questioning. Yeah, I understand. I understand the rights. I know this is bullshit, though, man. I got thrown out of a fucking window. Please get in the car, sir. Yeah, but tell me, sir, what's the charge? Possession of a concealed weapon and disturbing the peace. Disturbing the peace? I got thrown out of a window. What's the fucking charge for getting pushed out of a moving car, huh? Jaywalking? Beverly Hills Cop is often regarded as the best movie in 1984 due to a combination of factors. Eddie Murphy's standout performance as Detective Axel Axel Foley is a key element, earning widespread acclaim for his comedic timing and charismatic portrayal. The film's success lies in its ability to seamlessly blend action comedy genres, offering a unique and entertaining experience for diverse audiences. I think that's really important. This diverse audiences it reaches more people. The memorable soundtrack featuring Harold Feltmeyer's... Faltermeyer. Faltermeyer. Feltmeyer. I've heard it both ways, Aaron. Uh, Axel F theme adds to the movie's appeal and cultural impact as evidenced by the massive box, box office success. Beverly Hills Cop became the highest grossest, grossing movie of 1984. I'm going to say that bit again. Beverly Hills Cop became the highest grossing film of 1984 in the United States. I don't know if that's worldwide or not. Further solidifying significance of c- c- cinematic history. The movie's influence extended beyond its initial release, contributing to the rise of Eddie Murphy as a leading actor and spawning successful sequels. Uh, That's a little... (laughs) At least one successful sequel. At least one. While uh, opinions on the best film in 1984 may vary, these elements collectively make Beverly Hills Cop a standout and enduring classic for that year. My next movie... Because in 1984, parents just didn't give a shit about what we watched. <laughs> Is a nightmare in Elm Street. Did they put him away? All the lawyers got fat and the judge got famous, but somebody forgot to sign the search warrant in the right place and Kruger was free just like that. What did you do, Mother? A bunch of us parents tracked him down after they let him out. We found him in an old abandoned boiler room where he used to take his kids. Go on. Took gasoline. We poured it all around the place and made a trail of it out the door. Then lit the whole thing up and watched it burn. Nightmare on Elm Street is frequently regarded as a standout film of 1984, largely due to its innovative concept and impactful elements within the horror genre. Directed by Wes Craven, the movie introduced a groundbreaking idea of a killer, Freddy Krueger, haunting people's dreams to inflict real harm. Adding a chilling and unique dimension to the story, Robert England's portrayal of Freddy Krueger turned the character into an iconic horror movie villain leaving the lasting impression for on audiences the film employed creative cinematic techniques including practical effects and dreamlike sequences contributing to the effectiveness in, in delivering the scares and suspense with the significance of cultural impact nightmare on elm street led to a successful horror franchise and established freddy krueger as a pop culture icon the critical acclaim commercial success and enduring influences the film solidify this as one of the classics within the horror genre and a standout movie for 1984 those are my two movies i love them both they make me feel happy because there's something wrong with me apparently but again because 1984 our parents just didn't care about what we watched troy what about you i pass you don't get to pass. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not ready to make a vote yet. 
Oh, he's still thinking. <laughs> it's, he's so traumatic. He's like, he's got he's really having an good. existential crisis. Like, I swear to God, like I'm, I'm on a roll here and he's like, I pass. And he's got to really fuck up the whole thing. All right, Aaron, <laughs> you're next. All right. Well, this is, uh, this is the toughest one of all of them. If you want my honest opinion. That's why I pass. Yeah, it is. It really is. Because on one hand you have Eddie Murphy's best film, my opinion. I think overall, that's the best overall film that he's done. I'm a huge Eddie Murphy fan. My mother took me, speaking of mothers doing bad things, took me to see Eddie Murphy <laughs> Raw in person. Yeah, boy, the other parents at school were not thrilled with that. <laughs> but she still so went. Every, every school had that kid. Yep. Yeah, I was that kid. Yeah. God bless my mother. She believed I could handle it, and she was right. Uh, but she also took me to see rated R movies from when I was like six or seven years old. Like She was very, very, as long as it wasn't sexual, she she would take me. That was kind of like her her vibe. And um, man, we really bonded over Eddie Murphy. We still do. Like we're both excited for Beverly Hills Cop Four to come out. So I love that movie so much. the The action is on point. The there's actually a a very real story. He's really out there trying to right his friend's wrong, you know. And his friend made a mistake, but he he didn't deserve what what he got. And Axel Foley is going to make sure that whoever did this is going to pay. Also learned what herpes was because of that movie. I'm like, what is herpes simplex tan? And <laughs> had to look it up. Boy, that'll change your life. So then you've got, <laughs> you've got uh, the rest of the film. It's just, I mean, he's he's perfect in terms of, of his comedic delivery, but he also gives a real performance and there are characters you can get behind all the way through. It's amazing that Judge Reinhold is in two fantastic movies and where's his career now. But then you have, on the flip side, and I'm on Elm Street, probably one of the most innovative and creative horror movies of all time. I mean, and Stan, you were talking about being scared by gremlins. Nightmare on Elm Street terrified me. I was just, I'm like, they, I wasn't scared of many horror movies, but that one I was. The, the idea that someone can get me in my dreams, just that entire concept was fantastic. It was, it was something that blew me away at the time. I don't know if they ever really captured what the full potential of Freddy Krueger was, but I think they, they tried as often as they could to get it right. And it just created this enigmatic character that became an icon. And while Axel Foley, I would say the movie in Axel Foley gave me so much joy. Uh, still does. I still rewatch both of the first two movies. Uh, Beverly Hills Cup three can just go die in a fiery, blaze for all i care because that movie is just absolutely abysmal but the first two movies are, are gold and i i love the second one all, almost as much as the first one and i love the soundtrack more shakedown breakdown takedown you're busted i love that song um <laughs> but i think i'm going nightmare on elm street because i just i just feel like that one really blew me away in, in a lot of ways and like just really just really caught my attention as a kid and how creative and clever it was. And I know they didn't have a lot of money and he made the, the best of it. It's just the whole idea of it just blew me away. Ironically, the movie ice pirates was the movie that taught me what herpes was. <laughs> and that's also 1984. Weird. That was the year yeah. for it. Apparently. Apparently it was. <laughs> All right, Troy, you ready? Sure. All right, go. Uh, for those of you that listened to our episode last week on the Oscars, we had this whole like should win and will win. Um, should win is Beverly Hills Cop because Eddie Murphy is fantastic in that role. It's a it's iconic in a lot of ways. A lot of things Aaron just said that I will not repeat. Um, it is a great, fun, entertaining film that you'll remember to the end of your days because it's so good. But will win is Nightmare on Elm Street. Because I was scared shitless of that man for many, 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 many years. <laughs> All the way up till about Nightmare on Elm Street 6, I think is finally where I was like, okay, this isn't really real. Um, that Freddy Krueger is just such an iconic horror movie villain that I don't do horror movies. I mean, I watch The Ring and unfortunately I watch The Grudge. Uh, but I don't do horror movies because I think Nightmare on Elm Street seriously freaked me out that horror movies were not my genre. And because of that, I think that this has to move forward because so many innovative things with horror movies done here. So much of the 
making you believe it was actually real. Um, you know, it, it spawns the second movie, which actually deals with being gay um, in a really interesting way. And then, of course, Dream Warriors is just fucking kick ass. Um, and they bring Nancy back, of course, in the third movie. So I, I think it sets up a really great franchise. I think when people think about these two movies, like Freddy Krueger comes to top of mind first before Axel Foley does. So, yeah, I have to go with Aaron and choose Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, I, I just kind of want to say thank you to the both of you for agreeing on this because it gets me the opportunity to say this. Stan, no one gives a shit about what you say. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead anyways. Uh, it's nothing new. Nothing new, uh, professionally or personally. So, um, <laughs> well, you know, I was a huge Eddie Murphy fan. I loved him on Saturday Night Live. Um, I loved him in Trading Places. Uh, and... Beverly Hills Cop, for whatever reason, I, I don't. I haven't seen it in twenty plus years. It, it didn't make a huge impact on me. Um, so I remember enjoying it, but I, I just it was one of the like, okay, yeah, it was, it was good. It's not my favorite Eddie. Um, uh, I know that a lot of folks think it's his his best movie, and it very well may be. Um, but for my taste, I would I would take him in in other other things. Vampire in um, Brooklyn's your choice. Uh, I was uh, the 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 clumps. Oh, okay. was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Golden yeah. Child. That, that's oh, a good the one. Golden um, Child. Norbit. <laughs> so. Norbit. Uh, you just said Norbit. <laughs> you, you just I've never seen it. Never seen it. Never seen it. Okay. 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 All right. Can I, I have the knife? The, there was um <laughs> he had this like spectacular I do love uh Golden Child, by the That's way. Good. Um yeah. You know uh, uh, what is it? Beverly Hills Cop was supposed to be a Stallone yeah, movie at it one was. point. Yep. It, and it turned into Cobra. So whew. Bullet dodged. <laughs> uh but I absolutely love Nightmare on Elm Street. I actually, my my introduction was was Dream Warriors. Um at like a friend's sleepover, and he had it, and I was like, "Ooh, I don't, I don't know, man. I it looks pretty the first scary. Time. It must be a thing." No, that's that's <laughs> how we watched every scary movie as a kid, right? It's like, "Oh, we're gonna just watch these movies, okay? Just we've got Bambi. Just like leave us the hell alone, kids. Just go, just don't destroy the house, <laughs> exactly." <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's the 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 music is great. The musical stingers are great. Uh, he's such a, a fantastic character. Nancy's such a great final girl. You get Johnny Depp turned into a bloodbath, uh, not in a divorce trial. Um, so <laughs> it's it's a uh, you know it's got it's got a whole heck of a lot. I just I adore Nightmare on Elm Street. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, we have our final four. So now we're gonna break them into whole north and whole south and uh, decide. What's going to go to the final round? You don't have to have be as uh, wordy if you don't want to, but you can explain your answers if you choose to. It's up to you. So, Ho North, the finalists are Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom versus Ghostbusters. That's a real debate. And I like how both of these are like blockbuster versus horror is kind of how it's going to how it's going to pan out. Stan, you're the guest, you go first. And remember if we have a tie, the poll will decide the winner. Yeah, I, I wish I had a tracker of how many times I've watched all these movies over the past 40 years because uh, it's just, it's, it's dozens and dozens, if not hundreds mm -hmm. in some cases. Both of, so, yeah, all of them, actually. Uh, yeah. 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 Th these are, uh, these are great. Um, man, I love Bill Murray. I love Dan Aykroyd. I love Harold Ramis. And like you said, Ernie Hudson doesn't get enough credits. Um, you know, I love the Stay Buff Marshmallow Man. Ackroyd getting uh, some sexy time with a ghost at some point in time <laughs> is is fabulous. That doesn't get loved enough. Rick Moranis doesn't get enough mm. credit in this movie. That's that's who uh, is the unsung hero. But still, it's Indiana Jones in the original trilogy, which um, it's it's going to be tough to beat it. And like I said, that bridge scene alone might carry it, this decision. So I'm going with Temple of Doom. All right, Troy. Uh, Ghostbusters clearly gets the nod for me because I mean, any movie where it's like pretty much ad lib the entire time and stay puff marshmallow man and really bad CGI dogs. That you just laugh at. I'm the gatekeeper. I'm the key master. 
And you're they trying to like CGI. see if these two are actually going to get together and do weird things with each other because it's the most unlikely pairing of a couple you've ever seen in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the fact that it just grossed as much as it did in that year, right? Because we knocked out the top grossing movie. Uh, I do believe. Uh, and so this would be the last remaining top grossing movie in these final four. So with that, Ghostbusters would definitely edge out Temple of Doom for me. John? Like I want to I want to say Ghostbusters just because it's just so just so that I can tell Troy that those not, were not CGI dogs because they weren't. Uh, that was all practical camera effects, all that jazz. Ray Harryhausen probably had his hand in there. That's that's what I want to be able to well, say. It looks like my, shit. That's what he's saying. Well, I mean, he could say that, and that's fine, especially by today's standards. But by 1984 standards, that was that was some choice work. Uh, it doesn't matter because Temple of Doom gets it for me. Oh, so I can tie it, or I can just carry this over. This is a, the easiest choice. Uh, it's Temple of Doom. I I love Ghostbusters. I've watched both of these. I don't know how many times over the years, but. When I think my entire childhood, I think Temple of Doom. When I think every bit of joy in the 80s, I think Temple of Doom. I mean, I had the hat. I had the whip. I wanted to be short round because I really hoped I could meet Harrison Ford because I thought he was real. He was really Indiana Jones. And he would take me globe charting on adventures if I just was nice to him. And I knew how to work a whip. Well, I didn't. And he never came to my house. <laughs> but thankfully, I still had that movie. So Temple of Doom moves on. Now, Ho South. This is this is one this is tough. Gremlins versus a Nightmare on Elm Street. This is like the most perpetual eighty horror films pitted against each other. Because I would call Gremlins a horror film, horror comedy, I guess. Uh, John, how about you? What say you? This is so tough for me because I want to say my movie because I picked my movie, but I also want to say Gremlins because with Gremlins I have that solid early memory attached to it i don't have the same thing with nightmare on elm street so that's why i'm going to say gremlins okay troy uh gremlins clearly gets the vote because we actually did a remake this movie right podcast you can find that at remake this movie right.com for gremlins turned kremlins it was amazing uh but gremlins is like a, a classic staple i mean you can't go through the holiday season and not think of gremlins you can't go through 1984 without thinking of gremlins Gremlins, people still talk about Mogwise to this day. There probably needs to be a reboot or remaster of some kind uh, for this property uh, since everything else from 1984 is apparently still alive and kicking at this point in time. But yeah, unfortunately for Freddy Krueger, um, his claws just do not reach as far as Spike's humor and tenacity and crassness. So therefore, Gremlins continues. Didn't they do on HBO Max? Didn't they do or Max, whatever you want to call it? An animated series. An animated series. Yeah. Yeah, but they need a new movie. I'm sure they're working on it. Wash Gremlins 2 away from oh, the Oh, yeah, fold. Gremlins 2. You want to talk about awful sequels. Gremlins Hell's Cap 3, Gremlins 2, Nightmare on Elm Street. All, most the of them. one bit about Gremlins 2 that I love is that at one point, Phoebe Kate's character is about to launch into another sad story, and they just cut her off, and they keep going. <laughs> That's true. No, Gremlins 2 is all about how you watch it. You gotta. It's, it's more it's, meta. It's, it's meant pure, to be more meta than it, very than meta. It. It's a pure comedy. It's uh, it's fantastic. I, I was recently reminded of the Key and Peel skit where they're pitching Gremlins 2. And if uh, if you haven't seen it, it, it's worth a watch. That's a good bit. All right, what say you, Stan? Oh man, um, they are both movies that I revisit regularly. Um, I, I watched Gremlins this Christmas. I probably watched Nightmare on Elm Street last Halloween. Um, so they both have special places in my heart. Um, ultimately, I'm I'm going to have to go with that that scariest uh, theater experience that I've ever had, and, and go with Gremlins. Okay, well, Gremlins moves ahead. My vote would be Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, taking away nothing from gremlins it's just you know you talked about your your terror experience it's one of the few movies that has frightened me in my lifetime evil dead's up there too but we're not talking about 81 so there we go all right now final round sorry mr miyagi didn't come over final round you've got indiana jones and the temple of doom versus gremlins two quintessential classics by all accounts, 
great films. We love both of these movies. They're high on everybody's list, but if one, there's only one winner. And you don't, it's not about your choice. It's about the best choice for 1984. Let's see you, Stan. I'm going to let you go again first again because you are the guest. Oh, man. Uh, can I pull a Troy and just pass? Yeah, you, we can come back to you last. Forever? No, yeah. no. We, we, could say, uh, we could say the parents were the winners because they got their PG-13 rating from these true. two movies. Hey, the, the oh, finalists oh. got us that PG-13 <laughs> rating, baby. Molaram, Sugar Which came out later that year. Um, I almost picked the first PG-13 movie uh, Red, being Red, Red Dawn. Dawn. Yeah. Wolverines. Um, 84 is such a good year. Such a good year. It was yeah. great. It 16 was 16 Candles. We didn't mention that one. John Hughes classic. You know, up until this moment, I might have gone one way without really thinking about it because on one hand, I've got my childhood hero. And on the other hand, I've got a movie that I really do just think hit a dozen different genres and sticks to landing on all of them. Um, I hate to I hate to do it, Indy. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna go Gremlins. Oh, all right, all right, Troy. I can already see oh. you wiggling. Well, I mean, S- Spike, Gizmo, even the the bathroom buddy to this day <laughs> will always remain as iconic Hollywood stalwarts of movie creation. Um, you know, just the. You can still hum the tune. I mean, it's 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 burned into your brain. So yeah, Gremlins has to beat out Temple of Doom because it's just so freaking cute. You just want to squeeze up. You're right. That tune's definitely more memorable than the Indiana Jones theme song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, John, mm-hmm. I'm going to do you a favor because everybody already knows my vote. So I'm just going to say it's Temple of Doom. Just okay. go ahead and clear that out. So you get to All be right. either the tie or the deciding factor. You choose. Uh, it's Temple of Doom, hands down, between these two movies. <laughs> That means we go to the poll. Listers decide. <laughs> oh my God. Hold, please. <laughs> He's so excited. <laughs> okay. Gremlins has a 7% vote. Now keep in mind, this is for all the films in 1984. So there's a lot of, a lot of top notch ones here. Ghostbusters was actually number one, just to make you feel better. So there you go. In terms of listeners, Ghostbusters won, which I'm sure makes Troy very happy. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom had 13%. So therefore, it wins! The best movie of 1984! Yay! <laughs> the movie wins, John, not Aaron. Uh, the movie I, wins. Yes. No, I, <laughs> I said I'm the looking movie for wins. the angle. I'm looking for the angle here, because Aaron, I'm looking for Aaron to be like, yes, I picked the right movie. I did well. I, uh, Aaron doesn't do that. John apparently does that. It's hey, a John I, problem. This isn't a, you already had your win. How about you let Indy have this one? Because Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is the best movie of 1984. It's the best movie of 1984. Guys. As soon as I was like, I got my win. You came in as like, no, the movie won. You didn't win shit. I'm like, but I picked it. (laughs) Let Indy celebrate. He's retired. We all win. These are all great movies. Every single one of them I would watch tomorrow. Every one of them. That's true. In fact, it feels like a great marathon. Honestly. Feels feels like a great <laughs> post-Thanksgiving 1984, 10 movies in a row kind of thing. Yeah. We got nothing else to do. God, and remember videotape? Like, this is the one the kids don't understand with streaming and Blu-rays and everything else. If you watch that videotape more than 10 times, you had to buy a new, had one. Buy a new one. <laughs> you had to use the tracking. Yeah, you do have to use the tracking. Oh, man, there's a callback. God, it made me, You know, every time I think, boy, I wish I still had a VCR, you bring up the tracking and it kind of ruins it. Right. Yeah. More importantly, you needed to buy the rewind machine because you would ruin your VCR if you rewound <laughs> in the VCR. <laughs> you did. You, you had like the separate thing to rewind your tapes before you took them back. Oh, well, some of the rental places would charge you if you didn't. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get a 50 cent dollar surcharge for not rewinding. It takes time. Takes time. Don't have to rewind it's hard on the machine, streaming like said. title. That's for sure. God, you don't want that next customer getting a thing in the middle. You know, the kids are spoiled. That's what I'm saying. They absolutely are. Yeah. They'll never know the joy of going into a blockbuster. <laughs> Get off my lawn, and, you! Or mom and pop owned video store. Those are I mean, even. To, to be fair, to be fair, to be you fair. know, a an Eaton VHS tape is very similar to internet buffering. Just saying. Yeah, they'll they'll never know the joy of. 
pull, pulling the box down and realizing the tape's not there or getting a box of, to rent and it's the wrong movie because somebody put it in the wrong box or put it behind the wrong movie. <laughs> yeah, they'll never know that joy. When they pick a movie, they get the freaking thing they picked. Sons of bitches. <laughs> All that joy. <sighs> well, there we go, kids. That's 1984. Woo! Finally, Indy won something. Did you see that Dial of Destiny got nominated for a Razzie? Shut what? up. What, what was it nominated on? for? For for like a worse sequel or something like that. I'm like, I'm tired of it. Like, go look at the audience reactions and the actual uh, Rotten Tomatoes review. All positive. Sh- stop it. Stop trying to make that a bad movie. It was not. I've been done with the, the concept of the Razzie for many years. Me too. It's, the it's, Crystal it's, Skull it's done. gets the Razzie, therefore this can't get the Razzie. So. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, Last Starfighter came out in 84 too. Oh man, there's love Last Starfighter. Yep, a lot love of that movie. There's so many. Guys. I have it on Blu-ray. <laughs> Do you I, really? I, I have it on Blu-ray. Oh yeah, I have it on Blu-ray, and I have it on download on uh, the service that I watch stuff from. Top Secret. Top Secret. That's a good one. We also did a remake this movie right for the Last Starfighter. We did. I don't think remake this movie right is actually still there. Dot com, but the web, but the podcast is still there. You can still find the podcast. Um. Did you get rid of the domain? Why would you get rid of the domain? Because we're not making episodes anymore. Why would you keep it? Redirect Google traffic. I did that for a while. Uh, Firestarter, Amadeus, that one best picture, I believe. Amadeus, 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 Jesus. Amadeus, Amadeus. I need a, I need an afternoon to rewatch that one. It is, it is a great movie. Children of the Corn. That's a good one. A great 30 minutes. <laughs> Dreamscape. Ooh, Dreamscape. Ooh. Dreamscape was a good one too. Yes. The other movie about People killing one another in their dreams. Mm-hmm. It's true. Dennis Quaid's behind it. Uh, DC Cab, Christine. I like forget V nineteen eighty four. I like DC Cab a lot. Um, Body Double. <laughs> that was a great movie. Wow, man, what a great freaking year! What a great year! Absolutely wonderful year. And we're done with it because Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is the best movie that came out that year. All right, sorry, Ghostbusters. Ha! <laughs> go bust, go someplace else. What? Know. Why did you sound like a toddler just now? <laughs> I don't know. I just, you know, I, I, I was trying to think of the like the most Troy thing I could say in the moment. And you said the most John thing ever. All right, oh, Stan. Oh. Thanks for being. Thanks for being here, man. Appreciate you coming by. Pleasure as always. All right, and John and Troy. Thanks. What? Just thanks. <laughs> just thanks. Whatever. The next time I watch the Ewok Adventure, I will definitely buy popcorn. Dude, I love the Ewok Adventure. I love yeah, that. One, one of the gets, Ewok movies came out in 84. Yeah. That they, one gets more hate than it deserves. They were so good. I wanted to hang out with those little guys. They were adorable. All right. The one thing that made Ewoks cool was those movies. The next time you head to a theater or sit comfortably on your couch, digging out your VCR so you can watch the real, real quality versions of 1984 movies, buy popcorn. Like real quality. Real quality. You can track the shit out of it and you rewind it and you just like. Man, there's now that you're talking about, there's so many steps that went into watching movies in the 80s. Oh, yeah. It's like work. He had to have his like a little sibling to go and push the buttons for you because you didn't want to get up. <laughs> it's true. I had a remote with a wire. The wire. Did you the wire, wire, wire? <laughs> Oh, God. We're so old. <laughs> <laughs> the couch was just too far it away was. and you really couldn't even use the remote. I guess I'm going to sit on the floor and watch this. Jesus, this sucks. <laughs>